Welcome to a brand new edition of Problematic Women. I'm Lauren Evans, and guest hosting with me today is... Virginia Allen. So great to have you again. I think this is the third week in a row. It is. Awesome. I love having you on, Virginia. We have such a great show for you today on Problematic Women. We'll be discussing the left's use of children as political props. This time to fight climate change. A Dancing with the Stars contestant is forced to delete his Twitter after backlash for saying nice things about Sean Spicer. Taylor Swift said she's, quote, obsessed with politics... We bring on heritage expert Rachel Gressler to break down the gender wage gap. And we'll be crowning a very extra special Problematic Woman of the Week. Each week on Problematic Women, we sort through the news to find stories that are of particular interest to conservative-leaning or problematic women. Those whose views and opinions are often excluded by those on the so-called feminist left. If you are a problematic woman or just someone who supports strong, independent women, Please consider supporting us by leaving a review or five-star ratings on iTunes and encouraging others to subscribe. It really does make a difference. We're going to kick off today's show talking about Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg, who took to the stage on Monday at the UN's Climate Action Summit to scold world leaders for their failure to combat climate change. I shouldn't be up here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. Yet, you all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? Videos of her fiery rhetoric, neat side braid, and impressionable expressions have flooded social media. But who was Greta before Monday? The now 16-year-old Greta began worrying about climate change at age 11. And in her 2018 TED Talk, she describes it like this. So when I was 11, I became ill, I fell into depression, I stopped talking, and I stopped eating. In two months, I lost about 10 kilos of weight. Later on, I was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, OCD, and selective mutism. That basically means I only speak when I think it's necessary. Now is one of those moments. For those of us who are on the spectrum, almost everything is black or white. We aren't very good at lying, and we usually don't enjoy participating in the social game that the rest of you seem so fond of. (laughs) I think in many ways that we autistic are the normal ones, and the rest of the people are pretty strange. (laughs) Especially when it comes to the sustainability crisis, where everyone keeps saying that climate change is an existential threat, and the most important issue of all. And yet, they just carry on like before. I don't understand that, because if the emissions have to stop, then we must stop the emissions. To me, that is black or white. There are no gray areas when it comes to survival. Either we go on as a civilization or we don't. In 2018, Greta started skipping school on Fridays to protest the climate crisis outside the Swedish parliament. And since then, her small act of rebellion has evolved into the Fridays for Future movement, which encourages young people to strike or have peaceful protests on Fridays to demand that political leaders do something about climate change. In May of 2019, Fridays for Future successfully mobilized a day of strikes in 130 countries. Lauren... After Greta spoke, Twitter just exploded. Everyone had a hot take. But what do you think our response should be to Greta's passion and her appearance at the U.N.? Well, first off, I have to say I love when European little children talk. It always sounds to me like Mary Poppins or something. But my first thought is where are her parents and and why do her parents allow her, A, to skip school every Friday? You think that's 20 percent of your schooling I get every once in a while it's good to take your kids out and they get to learn outside the classroom. You know, I'm not anti-kids doing political activism and even missing school for that. But every Friday seems like she's missing important assignments. And also, too, somebody had to put this in her head. 
that the world's going to end and and this alarmism in her. Um, and it, it kind of scares me in a way that, that sh- this young, impressionable girl spends so much of her time worrying about climate change. And, and we should be teaching our young people to kind of think politically and engage in civics. But when you kind of front load and, and add these fears to children, they're not it's not a healthy rate of development. She's going to a burn out as an activist and B, she's not going to really be able to see both sides of the issue and make rational judgment. And I think my my question as to where were her parents was really around her speech at the U.N. It's like, did anyone read this before she delivered it? Because it it was very disrespectful, in my opinion. Her her tone was not at all honoring of being in the presence of world leaders. And, you know, this is something she's passionate about. She's frustrated. And that's okay to let that passion come through. But it needs to come through in a way that is still very honoring and that recognizes that you are incredibly honored to be seated in front of all these world leaders and you need to address them with respect. What do you think that the danger is of of using kids in a way almost as as political props to put them on the front of these issues and let them become these spokespeople around these big world issues? Well, I think you saw it with the Parkland kids as the same example. When you take a stance against them, it's like, oh, my gosh, how can you take a stance against these school shooting survivors? And and it's the same way. This girl is so adorable and precious. Like, how could you take a stance against her? She just wants to do her civic duty. And it really just stifles debate. And there's a big danger in that because you're not able to get out your position or feel comfortable getting out your position. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. I think that it's. It's great, like you said, like young people should be civically involved, but they shouldn't be the ones setting policy necessarily around these around these issues. So another climate activist, Emma Lim of Canada, has gained a lot of attention recently for her No Future pledge or the hashtag No Future No Children, which is driven by the idea that we shouldn't be bringing more people into this world until we solve climate change. Lim uh, wrote on her website, even though I want to have children more than almost anything, what kind of a mother would I be if I brought a baby into a world where I couldn't make sure they were safe? So, Lauren, what do you think the danger is in this kind of thinking and logic? So I think it's the same thing as with Greta, where she's so young and she hasn't had enough time for her to really develop what she believes in. I think I go back when I was in high school, I was treasurer of my Young Democrats Club. Were you, you really? Know? But it was just my mom was a Republican and I wanted to, you know, kind of wow. just fight, fight back a little, a little bit against. So so you're young and and it's important to kind of think through things and chew through things. And I, I went through a big political activism, luckily right of center through in college. But, you know, you, you have to take the time. And I think the other thing is when you're 16, 17, 18 – Unless you're a teen mom, like having kids is so outside your perspective. And it's easy to say like, oh, I'll never have kids and like hashtag I'll never have kids. But I think if you were a 38 year old woman saying that same thing, it would be like, oh, I'm not having kids. But but they're just kind of throwing words out there and they don't understand a what they're protesting and they don't understand B what they're they're giving up to protest. Yeah. And. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting that you know she says I I wouldn't bring a child into the world where I couldn't make sure they were safe. Well, honestly, we never have that guarantee. There's always something going on in the world that we could point to and say, well, the world isn't safe, so I don't want to bring a child in. But then we would have all gone extinct if we made that <laughs> excuse. Like it, we can't we can't always guarantee that that safety. So in so many ways, there's there's a step of faith in having kids. And, you know, I'm I'm no environmental expert, but I I do think it's really important for us to engage in these conversations and around these issues. And my hope is that Greta's remarks and that Lim's hashtag campaign will drive people to actually seek out the facts around climate change and global warming. The Heritage Foundation is a great resource for that data. Nick Loris is an economist at the Heritage Foundation and has written a great deal on climate change. And he recently came out with a report discussing the Green New Deal and what that would look like if it was actually implemented. And I want to read one quote from him in that piece. He says, quote, using the same climate sensitivity as the U.N.'s Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change assumes in its modeling, the world would be only 0.1% 
137 degrees Celsius cooler by 2100, even if we assume every other industrialized country would be equally on board, this would merely avert warming by 0.278 degrees Celsius by the turn of the century. Not, uh, not a lot of change there. So important that we actually take the time to stop, do the research, look at the facts, and it, you know, it's so easy to kind of rant and rail and say something has to be done, but are these things that we're advocating for, would they even make a difference? Yeah, and a lot of it goes back, too, to developing countries that it's kind of a short-term investment when they're they're really bad on climate resources, but they're able to pull themselves out of that and then become more environmentally conscious. And when you're putting these regulations on these countries, you're actually forcing more people into poverty and having lower quality of life than, as you said, Virginia, 0.13 Celsius degrees, which would really wouldn't affect our planet at all. So, Virginia... I wanted you to put yourself in the shoes of Greta or Emma. If you were 16 or or 17 and people were telling you that the earth would be unsustainable by the time you're 50, you would probably be pretty scared too. So what's your message to Generation Z who's hearing this all the time and, and how do you comfort them? Yeah, you know, I think you're you're right. I think if I was in Greta's shoes and kind of had heard this nonstop rhetoric of the world is going to end, that's pretty terrifying for a young person to hear. For young people listening or as you're interacting with your friends, two pieces of advice. First, take the time to do a little research. Like I said, the Heritage Foundation is a great resource. Go on our, our YouTube page. We have a lot of great videos about this as well. But also think about how you can take action. Instead of just protesting the government, what can you do at your school, in your family, to be a part of protecting our planet? Whether that's, you know, advocating for recycling bins at your school or organizing cleanup days in your community to pick up trash. But be empowered to take action yourself instead of just complaining about the problem. My mother always told me, true conservatives always conserve. That's great. I love that. I'm going to use that. (laughs) Well, it is easy to get overwhelmed by the 24-7 news cycle, and I know that you might be overwhelmed too. So if you are looking for a way to keep up with the news that matters, the Daily Signal podcast brings you the top news of the day. I co-host the Monday edition with my colleague, Rob Bluey, to bring you interviews with lawmakers, authors, and conservative activists. And of course, we start your week off right with a good news story. So if you're a conservative who wants to be on top of the news, check out the Daily Signal podcast available every weekday morning. All right, welcome back. We have a couple more really great topics to break down with you. First off, Queer Eye star and current Dancing with the Stars contestant, Karamo, recently received so much hate on Twitter that he deleted his account. Why? Because of what he said about Sean Spicer. Um, actually, no, let me tell you something. Sean Spicer and I have been talking. Yeah, like literally I can't, I was most excited to meet him because like the thing is, is that people would look at us and think that we're polar opposites, but I'm a big believer that if you can talk to someone and meet in the middle, you can learn about each other and help each other both grow. And so we have been chatting all day today. Like he's a good guy, really sweet guy. So if you don't remember who Sean Spicer was, he was the White House press secretary for Donald Trump's first year in office. But just this one comment led to a huge backlash from his Twitter community. One tweet by TV personality and news contributor Scott Nevin said, quote, this is so misguided of at Karamo. We are long past the point of listening and, quote, meeting in the middle. This is not in all capitals about politics. It's about morals and truth. We know who he is and what he has done. Playing nicely only enables them and rewards them. At the Emmys this Sunday, Karamo addressed the drama over his Sean Spicer comments. I want people to know that I think that as a country, we have to always try to reach out to those that are different from us and try to figure out how to have conversations. And that's most important. He continued on to say, quote, the way I was raised by my parents is that you always have to reach out and try to do the work. There has to be a soldier that wants to step up to the front line. And if I'm going to get hate for being that soldier, that's OK with me. Virginia, what do the responses to Karamo's initial interview say about kind of the current culture we're in and in the entertainment and political world. I think it's really sad. I so applaud Karamo for being willing 
to just kind of be normal about this and say, yeah, you know, I'm I'm in this show with this guy. We have very different political beliefs, but he's actually a cool guy. And to me, that's just yeah, yeah, that's that's normal. We all interact with people all the time that we disagree with. And it's important that we find those areas where we do connect and relate and can find common ground. And it's just really sad to see the the backlash that he got from this. And I think it's important to remember Sean Spicer is not this far right figure. He was literally just White House press secretary for our current president. And the fact that Karamo isn't even endorsing this, he's just saying, hey, I, I like to have discussions with him. And he got so much hate. He had to delete his Twitter account. It's just it's crazy to me. It really is crazy. But I will say I I kind of applaud him for getting off Twitter. <laughs> yeah. And, and how many celebrities kind of get this backlash and then they they're like, oh, never mind. I didn't mean to associate with that person. I see the error of my ways. So good for Karamo for actually saying my parents raised me this way. I'm going to stick to my guns. Yeah. No, he he took a stand and he did it in a really classy way. And I want to bring up this other example of cancel culture that came up. There's a guy named Carson King. And at the Iowa State Iowa game, uh, I mentioned it last week, there's a uh, television show called College Game Day. And every Saturday morning from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., announcers, they just kind of pick games and they, they talk about what's going to happen that day. And part of it is like there's a bunch of people who stand behind the announcers and they hold signs. Carson, this kid, had a sign with his Venmo handle and he's like, send beer money, right? Hilarious. He didn't expect to get a ton of money, but actually he got like tens of thousands of dollars. And he's like, wow, this is this is a lot of money. You know, all he needed was 10 bucks for a case of Miller Lite. And so he decided to do something good with that money. He decided to donate it to the University of Iowa's Children's Hospital. There's this really cool moment in uh, University of Iowa home games where the hospital looks onto the field at the University of Iowa. And so I think it's at the half. It might be after the first quarter. But all the fans look up to the children standing in the window. They're going through chemotherapy. They're sick. And they're standing at the window. And they wave. And then, you know, like 50,000 people all wave back. And it's just like this moment that you just want to, like, cry thinking about it. And so Carson did this great thing. He raised all this money. Um, He posted online the the sum of money actually went up to one million dollars that he was going to donate to this children's hospital. The Des Moines Register ended up doing a story on him and kind of looked up his history. And he was found to say something. I can't find what the exact tweet says, but he quoted Tosh.0 in 2011 when he was 16 years old. It was something racially charged. And the Des Moines Register was going to run with the story. He came out ahead of it. But. Uh, Amheuser Bush has cut ties with him. They said they're going to continue to match funds with the hospital, but they're not going to work with Carson anymore. And it just shows this kid probably said something stupid when he was 16. It doesn't sound like it was anything at anyone. If you've ever watched Tosh.0, kind of just like dumb, cute, comedy central humor. And like now this story, this great story of this kid who raised all this money for this awesome uh, children's hospital, kind of, again, showing the sportsmanship of college football. Yeah, now this story is about a tweet. And it blows my mind that in 2019 that we're so focused on just like the little thing that anybody does wrong. And we can't look at the big picture of the good that people are doing. Yeah, no, it's totally crazy. It's it's the wrong narrative to be telling. We need to be celebrating this guy for the good work that he's doing and focusing on that. And sure, you know, when he was 16 years old, he screwed up, he posted something dumb. That's not something that we need to rehash a decade later. Uh, It honestly, it's just it's nonsensical. I'm glad that I didn't have Twitter when I was 16. I I hope that I wouldn't have said anything racially charged. But I watched Tosh.0 (laughs) <laughs> I mean, we all said stupid yeah. stuff when yeah. we were 16. So, yeah, the fact that now this story is about that, it, it just... But I, I would recommend looking that up. His name is Carson King. He is still raising money for the University of Iowa Children's Hospital. And definitely look up that video. Uh, I'll post in the show notes of, of the whole stadium waving at the, the, the children in the hospital. It's just, so precious. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, let's talk for a moment about one of our favorite celebrities, Taylor Swift. In an interview with Rolling Stone singer slash songwriter, Taylor Swift said that she's, quote, obsessed with politics. She went on to say, really, 
I keep trying to learn as much as I can about politics, and it's become something I'm now obsessed with, whereas before I was living in this sort of political ambivalence because the person I had voted for had always won, she said, essentially telling us that she had always voted for Democrats, besides the point. But Swift has become increasingly vocal about politics and is really using her star power to speak out in support of things like gun control and the LGBTQ protections. So during the interview, she said that she's focused on mobilizing Democrats ahead of the 2020 election and wants to use her celebrity status to, quote, help and not hinder, noting that celebrity support of Hillary Clinton really ended up backfiring in many ways. Swift went on to say, quote, we were in such an amazing time when Obama was president because foreign nations respected us. We were so excited to have this dignified person in the White House. I think a lot of people are like me where they just didn't really know that this could happen. But I'm just focused on the 2020 election. Emily Jasinski over at The Federalist wrote a really interesting piece on this titled Taylor Swift is losing her mystery. And what Emily pointed out is that for so long, we haven't really known who Taylor really was. You know, we kind of had these little glimpses into her dating life. But if we were to think about sitting down and having coffee with her, we wouldn't have really known the type of person that we were going to be meeting and talking with. But now we kind of do know. And she's just another left wing millennial. Lauren, if T-Swift is truly, quote, obsessed with politics, how do you think she should go about sharing that passion with her fans? Or should she even be sharing that interest? I think she should be able to 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 wear her politics on her sleeve. I mean, she does have a First Amendment right. But we can see on Spotify the number one artist for our listeners on Problematic Women. And every week it's Taylor Swift. And so she has to understand that not all of her fans agree with her. She can't vilify her fans. I agree. Um, You know, I think there's a balance there, but I'm certainly interested in that perspective that there is something powerful about allowing that kind of mystery to remain, and, and that's fading away. After the release of Taylor Swift's interview, the Heritage Foundation president, Kay Coles James, invited Taylor Swift to come to D.C. She said in a tweet, Taylor Swift You said you are obsessed with learning about politics, so I welcome you to visit us at the Heritage Foundation for a substantive policy discussion with our experts and me. Every day, we develop solutions to bring more freedom, opportunity, and prosperity to all Americans. So what do you think the chances are that Taylor Swift would take Mrs. James up on her offer and would actually come and join us here at Heritage for for some good political discussion. I think it's slim to none. We love Mrs. James here in the at the Heritage Building. She is so warm and she listens intently. I think it would really be great for Taylor and, and open up her, her mind and see Mrs. James is a woman who's gone through some things in her life to really understand the importance of conservative values. And, and she's really able to vocalize it in a, uh, a very powerful way. So I really wish she would. Oh, I th- Oh, I wish you would. Tell us what's wrong. <laughs> um, so, but I, I, I don't think it would ever happen. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's, it's pretty unlikely, but it would show a lot of boldness on Taylor Swift's part to take Mrs. James up on the offer, and I, I think she would get uh, a lot of, a lot of attention for it for sure. But at the end of the day, I, I think it would be a really good discussion. I agree, and we're gonna leave it there. When we come back, I have this really awesome interview with Rachel Gresler. We break down the gender wage gap, why it's in the news, and a new board game that promotes this idea to children. Welcome back. Today we have such a treat for you on Problematic Women. We have Rachel Gresler, research fellow from the Heritage Foundation in studio. Rachel spends a lot of her time thinking about the so-called wage gender gap and our economy as well. The so-called gender wage gap made headlines yet again this week with actress Michelle Williams bringing up the highly debated issue during her Emmy Award acceptance speech for Outstanding Lead Actress in a Limited Series or Movie. Take a listen. Thank you so much to FX and to Fox 21 Studios for supporting me completely and for paying me equally because they understood... (laughs) 
because they understood that when you put value into a person, it empowers that person to get in touch with their own inherent value. And then where do they put that value? They put it into their work. And so the next time a woman, and especially a woman of color, because she stands to make 52 cents on the dollar compared to her white male counterpart, tells you what she needs in order to do her job. Listen to her. Believe her. Because one day she might stand in front of you and say thank you for allowing her to succeed because of her workplace environment and not in spite of it. So, Rachel, let's start basic. Does this gender wage gap actually exist? Well, there is a so-called gender wage gap. And what that is, is it's a statistic. If you look at all men, all women across the U.S. The US who are employed full time, it shows that men make about a dollar for every, every 80 cents that women make. So it looks like there's about a 20 cent gap there. But that pay gap doesn't take into account anything that employers actually factor in when they're setting people's pay. So what it doesn't include is what is the individual's education? How many hours are they working what is their experience? What career field are they in? Do they have a flexible work schedule? All these things don't come into play. But then when you do some economic analysis and actually try to compare apples to apples jobs, you find that there's a very small pay gap, if any. So a Department of Labor study found that a more accurate comparison shows about a five to seven cent gap. And that's a 2009 study. A more recent study from last year found a mere two cent gap. And even that doesn't take into account some of the things that I think women tend to value more, such as a flexible schedule or more generous benefits. And one specific thing that William said is that women of color make 52 cents on the dollar compared to their white male counterpart. Does race also play a factor in this? I think at the end of the day, we all want people to be paid based on their performance and based on what they bring to the table. And so if there is a difference in pay that exists be across different um, genders or different races, we need to look at the source of that. Are there gaps in educational opportunities? And we shouldn't be trying to equalize pay across genders or across races because what that ultimately does is it takes away the choices that people are able to make in deciding what field of study they're going to go into, what hours they're going to work, what occupation. So someone who supports Michelle Williams would say she's the perfect person to be talking about this because when she was on a movie, All the Money, with Mark Wahlberg for reshoots, so after they shot the movie and they had to shoot some scenes over again, her co-star, Mark Wahlberg, was paid $1.5 million per day, while Williams was only paid $1,000. So supposedly these deals were both worked out independently with their agents. Do you think the producers looked at Michelle Williams as a woman and said, I'm going to pay you this much less? Or do you think there was something in the negotiations that was happening? No, I think this is kind of a unique instance. And we're talking about Hollywood where the figures are big. And this is just simply a failure of Michelle Williams' agent to negotiate a higher pay level for her. And after the speech you heard, um, the audience made up of mostly wealthy celebrities, they were just applauding. Does it rub you the wrong way? Do you think they're just virtue signaling or do you think they're actually wanting to solve this issue? Well, that's what I wonder. If Michelle Williams really wants to help people who are being discriminated against or who have lower incomes, whatever that reason is, then what is she doing? Is she giving her money away? Is she giving her time away? And I think that time is actually a, a really more important thing for people to do. Um, so are the people that care about this actually doing anything to try and solve what they see as a problem? And what are those policy issues that we can be doing to help women? Well, I don't think that federal policymakers or state and local policymakers need to be stepping in. You know, I look at the huge gains that women have made over the past decades in the labor force and not just in the jobs that they've been able to attain, whether it's climbing to be, you know, the CEO of a company. Um, but look at the mom who's selling things on Etsy and just the choices and opportunities that women and men alike have today. Um, there's so much more available to women in the labor market, and they can do things that fit them at any stage in their life, um, and they have opportunities that just simply didn't exist before. And so I think we need to be trying to enact policies that continue to let that flexibility exist, You know, not doing things like California did last week to implement a law that basically tries to wipe out the gig economy and anybody who's an in independent worker. What does that do to the millions of women there 
who rely on whether it's a gig job or their own independent business to say that you can't work anymore unless you become a formal employee and answer to a boss. And the gig economy is a phrase that's been thrown out as a buzzword a lot. Can you explain to our audience what that actually is? The best way, you know, think about a gig economy, everybody looks at Uber, TaskRabbit, these things that are classified as a gig that you can pick up on your own time based on what works for you. You don't have to take the job if you don't want to. But it's really bigger than just, you know, the, the big companies we know of, Uber, TaskRabbit, et cetera. It's Etsy. It's also independent workers. If you have your own contracting company or if you're an independent truck driver, it's all these your janitor, a construction worker that goes and works for multiple different companies. Um, these are all independent gig type jobs that would be affected by legislation that tries to make everybody answer to a boss. So the idea would be like, let's say a mother has children at school from nine to three. She could find something that works in that time period or, or maybe like after her kids go to sleep. Exactly. And she can do it in, during school. And if her kid's sick, she doesn't have to do the job that day. These are completely optional jobs that are just there. You download the app. You choose whether or not you want to do it in a certain day. Or it's also the jobs you have your own company and you're in charge of the work and you choose which contracts that you want to sign and agree to perform a certain job or not. And I think it's so fascinating because, because these are mostly jobs that have been created not through government legislature or any policymakers, but this is, you know, now that you have an iPhone, it's so easy to order goods and services. Yes, it's the technology and innovation that's driving these job growths. So let's say you are a woman, and I know some women are in this of space of feeling like they are paid unfairly. What would be your advice to the, them? Like I said, we want to be paid for what we're worth. And so I think the advice is just to prove your worth. And there's also something to be said for having confidence in yourself and being able to negotiate. Studies have shown that women will rate themselves lower on things than men, and whether that's men being overconfident or women being underconfident, you know, somewhere in between. But having that confidence and also being willing to go in and negotiate for what you feel you're worth. That's probably the best advice that I got as, a, as an intern in D.C., Never say sorry for something that you're not sorry <laughs> about and never feel bad about bragging about yourself. And my colleagues would probably laugh because I love bragging about myself. But, <laughs> you know, I think so. I think that's such good advice of, of really make sure that first you value yourself so then your employers value you. I want to shift gears to another interesting topic that's been in the news. Miss Monopoly, it's the first board game where women make more than men. Can you kind of tell us what is Miss Monopoly and how it, how mm -hmm. does it vary from the original Monopoly? Yes, I love the original Monopoly. I remember playing it growing up and I think it's got great life lessons in there about finance. But this new Miss Monopoly, so it's really unfair playing rules is what it's all about. It gives women a 20% advantage every time that they pass go. They collect $240 while men collect only $200. You wrote this really great piece on Heritage.org where you discuss what would happen when your kids would play this game. You have three girls and three <laughs> boys. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So my kids actually have started playing Monopoly recently. And immediately I thought about how would they take this? The girls would be like, oh, this is great. I get an advantage. The boys would be angry that they had this advantage and probably poking jabs at them along the way about the fact that they're only winning because they've got that extra $40 every round. And so, you know, what happens in the end? Well, suppose the girls do win and they're feeling excited that they beat their brothers. But they're just going to stand there and say, you only won because the rules were unfair and the boys are going to be resentful and the girls aren't going to feel good because they feel like, oh, I didn't win really. I had to have a uh, edge up in the game in order to beat my brothers. And then what if the boys win? Well, then now the girls feel really bad because even with that advantage, <laughs> they couldn't beat their brothers. And so that pumps the boys up even more to say, I could beat you even when you had a head start. I mean, I just think that this engenders resentment and pride and... It just says there is an equality there when we don't want to be teaching our girls or our boys that they are going to be paid differently just because of their gender. We want them to think that they will be treated equally. We see all these adults and celebrities fall into this trap of, of believing the gender wage gap. And this board game is targeted towards children. And it does have good intentions in a way of we want to empower women and it empowers mm -hmm. women as scientists and inventors. But as a mother, what do you think about this idea of like, almost brainwashing our children to believe this from a very young age. I think it's unfortunate that so many people take this victimization mantra that they're teaching their children or men or women. 
I'd rather have us talk about the gains that women have made and how everybody is treated equally in this country. It's not that way around the rest of the world. And so what I tell my daughters and my sons is look at what you can do, not you as a girl or you as a boy, but just look at what you can do and the opportunity and the freedom that you have here. Rachel, last question. The gender gap is so easily debunked, but I know when I'm out with my friends who might not be political or or might not lean conservative, they just they'll bring it up kind of in passing. What's like a short elevator pitch that you can give to a young woman when someone just mentions like, oh, I'm only getting paid 73 cents on the dollar? I think I would tell them to, you know, if you really believe you're only getting 73 cents on the dollar, what can you do about that? I would go talk to my boss and I would prove to them, hey, here's my value and why am I not being paid for what I'm producing? But in terms of is there really a gender wage gap and what will be the consequences of enacting policies, we got to think through what this really looks like. If you try to create rigid pay scales, that's not going to help men or women. It's going to be one size fits all jobs that actually don't meet most workers' needs. Well, Rachel, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you. Okay, before we take a break, I want to tell you about a really great podcast. Each week, the Independent Women's Forum She Thinks podcast brings you fresh, relevant content in a fun way without the politically correct nonsense like we've been talking about this whole show. On She Thinks, substance and style supersede political spin. Led by friend of the show, Beverly Hallberg, She Thinks podcast features some of the country's top women conservative leaders and independent thinkers. Independent Women's Forum is known for championing women's rights to be heard and respected without the crutch of the female victimhood narrative espoused by the mainstream media, special interests, and the Hollywood elite. Check out what the buzz is about by subscribing to She Thinks Podcast wherever you get your podcast, or visit IWF.org. All right, welcome back. And for our last segment, we're going to crown an extra special problematic woman of the week. I'm so excited. As you might have noticed, my regular co-host and dear friend, Kelsey Bowler, has been absent the past couple weeks. And that's because, as we've been calling her, Baby B decided to make an early arrival. In honor of that, we are making Kelsey's brand new daughter, Scarlett Peyton Bowler, our Problematic Woman of the Week. Here's, (laughs) Here's an update directly from Kelsey and her husband, Luke. Scarlett Peyton Bowler was born on Thursday, September 12th at 4 pounds, 11 ounces, and 17.5 inches. Excited to see the world, Scarlett arrived at just 31 weeks and six days, but she was born with good lungs and vitals. She is spending the next several weeks getting bigger and stronger in the NICU, but thus far is doing great. Scarlett's middle name is in honor of the late Bree Payton, our dear friend and former co-host of Problematic Women, who passed away of the flu in December of last year. In honoring Bree, Kelsey hopes her little Scarlett will live as bold and as fearlessly as Bree, and giving her unexpected and very dramatic early arrival, she's off to a good start. Kelsey is hopeful that she'll be able to join the show next week, where she'll share a few more updates about Scarlett and her crazy journey into motherhood. In the meantime, she sends her sincere gratitude for all the prayers their little Scarlett has received. And man, she is such a precious baby. She's such a little chicken nugget. <laughs> the pictures I've seen of her, uh, she's just absolutely perfect. And we are so excited for Kelsey. She's going to be an amazing mom. So we're going to leave it there for this week's Problematic Women. Join us next Thursday for a brand new edition of Problematic Women. And in the meantime, please subscribe and share. Conservatives need your support in the podcast world. And again, we would greatly appreciate a five-star review on Spotify, SoundCloud, iTunes, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcast. It really does make a big difference. Have a great week. This podcast is a product of The Daily Signal, produced by Kelsey Bowler and Lauren Evans. Special thanks to our editor-in-chief, Katrina Trinko. We produce Problematic Women in remembrance of our dear friend and former co-host, Bree Payton.